Well, good morning. Um, I hope you've all had a whimsical morning. Um, <laughs> it's going to be my new word. Thank you, John Luke. Uh, <laughs> if I don't have the chance to meet you, my name's Jackson, and I, I get to be one of the youth workers here at the church. Um, I work alongside uh, Emma Burstow, uh, Ram, Rani Roberts, Millie Higlitz, Higlet, one Higlet, uh, and the, the kids and family pastor, Rachel Willis. Uh, and together we, we have the privilege of experiencing the, the chaos that you guys have experienced this morning each and every week. Uh, and it is a joy and it is a privilege. Uh, I've had the chance uh, to be part of Humoridge uh, for many years. Um, back to the time when I was one of the kids up on stage staring off into space uh, or doing the actions half a beat too late. So I've been a part of a, a lot of family services. Um, and I always thought that the, the family services, they were mainly for the, the kids and the youth that were up on stage, those who um, had the opportunity to, to run the service for, for the very first time. I thought it was great that, that we gave the kids and the youth a chance to, to use their abilities and their gifts to serve the church uh, in this way. Uh, and I still definitely think that is an important part of, of what we're doing today. But I actually think there's more to it. And if we're, if we're not careful, we can brush past today and think that that was all that this was about. In Matthew 18, we read this. At that time... The disciples came to Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus, calling to him a child, put him in the midst of all of them. And he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you'll never enter, enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on to say that whoever receives such a child in my name receives me. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believes in me to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone fastened around his neck and to be drowned in the depths of the sea. It's quite a, quite a light way to finish the passage today. Um, but these verses, I think they show us a few really important things. Firstly, let's address the, the, uh, the verse 5 and 6. Because here we see that, that children really matter to Jesus. They are important in his sight. They have incredible value. And we see this in both the instruction and the warning. The instruction to his followers is this. That the one who, who receives such a child, who, who accepts such a child, who cares for one, who loves for one of these little ones, does so to him. So closely does our God identify with and, and care about those in our society who could so easily be overlooked or mistreated. So much does he care about them that he wants his people to do the same. The heart of Christ is deeply affected by children. And if you're ever not sure about that, Reread verse 6, because it says, Whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, it would be better for him to have a great millstone tied around his neck and drowned in the depths of the sea. And I actually believe him. <laughs> Maybe this should be part of our Handle with Care series. Maybe we should just do a, a little bit on that. But the heart of Christ, it is, it is deeply affected by children. And one day he will judge the living and the dead. So hear his warning and heed his instruction. The second thing that we see in this passage is this. Throughout the Gospels, uh, again and again, uh, when it comes to the, the kingdom of God, the descriptions of the kingdom of God, Jesus, he, he regularly flips our expectations on, on the head, on their head. He completely inverts the normal way of doing things. It's led some to describe the kingdom of God as the upside down kingdom. The upside down kingdom. He says in Matthew 20, the one who is last shall be first and the first shall be last. 
In chapter 16, he says, the one who saves their life shall lose it. But the one who loses their life for my sake will find it. Instead of riding into Jerusalem on a noble steed um, in power and in might to overthrow the Roman occupation, we read that he comes humbly, mounted on a donkey. Not to overthrow the, the Romans, but to be beaten and rejected, to be crucified, dying for the ones who put him up on that cross. And in doing so, he overthrows the powers of sin and death. And so here we come in this passage again uh, to an insight into this upside down kingdom. The disciples come to him asking, who is going to be the greatest? In your kingdom, Lord, who will be the greatest? And we can almost read between the lines of this question here. It's almost as if they're asking, Lord, are we going to be great? How do we make sure that we secure a spot of, of honor and of status in your kingdom? Perhaps they're, they're asking from a place of self-interest or even of, of prideful lust for power. Or perhaps I'm wrong. Perhaps the question is, is asked with pure intentions. They're really trying to figure out which of the great saints is going to be up there uh, and is going to be honored. Is it Moses or, or Elijah, Abraham or, or David? But in the end, it doesn't really matter what their intention is because instead of giving a, a list of accomplishments or achievements, instead of talking about family lines or, or nobility, stature or wisdom, Jesus calls to him a small child. Standing this child in the midst of this group of, of Jewish men, he says this. This is who is going to be greatest. Unless you become like this kid, you, you cannot even see the kingdom. But the one who would humble himself, the one who would humble herself, like this child, that one will be the greatest in the kingdom. Can I just tell you that I do not think the disciples were expecting that. I think it would have shaken them from all their preconceived uh, societal expectations of, of greatness and honor. But Jesus knew that his disciples needed to be shown. They needed to be shown that in his kingdom, the way up is down. The way to greatness is through humbling oneself, to do away with, with pretense and big-headedness, to do away with ego and intellectual grandiosity. The only way, the only way to enter is to humble oneself, to come with the reliant faith of a child. He says, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. You see, I, I used to think that the family services were for the kids and the youth up here. But now I think it might be for us. Those of us who have been around a little bit longer, those who might have a little bit more knowledge greater theological understanding, those who might think ourselves a little wiser. Perhaps today Christ has brought before your eyes these kids and these youth to remind you that this, this is all that is required. Not your gifts, not your power, not your wisdom, not your influence, but a sincere faith and a, a wholehearted trust of one of his little ones. As a church, I think we really need our kids and our youth to shake us from all of our preconceived societal expectations of greatness and honor. We need to be reminded of what it's like to be a child, to trust in God like they do. 
We need to be reminded of the, the tenacious questioning of a teenager's faith as they grapple and wrestle with ideas and concepts that I have long left untouched. Today I feel like God might be calling us to do away with our pride and with our arrogance and with our adult sense of self-sufficiency and instead humble ourselves and approach him as our father. To rely not on ourselves, but to throw ourselves upon his grace and his mercy and his love. To go all in. I think that might be what today is about. So in a moment, I'm actually going to just ask Eli Smith to come up and he's just going to conclude the message. What he's got to say is more important than me. Then we're going to enjoy the baptism of, of Yah and Jessica. So don't miss their example. Don't miss their faith. Don't think that you've got it and maybe they don't. But if you need any more convincing as to the reason for this kind of humility that we're talking about today, you need only to look to the one who gave that instruction. Because Philippians 2, 6 to 11 records this, that though he was in very form God, he did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. Taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus humbled himself, the, the prince of heaven, taking on the form of a baby. Don't you see that the only way that we can hope to, to humble ourselves and become like these children is to realize that that is exactly what he has already done on our behalf. That he became not just like a child, he became a child. <laughs> that he humbled himself, not from the, the worldly status of, of a, a man or a woman, but from equal standing with God, humbled himself by taking on the very flesh that he created and then submitting, the, submitting himself to death on a cross to redeem the sinners that put, himself, put him there. Sinners like you and I. Verse nine, therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God, the father. This is the one that calls us to humility, not from a lofty position of grandeur, but because he has demonstrated that humility is simply how his kingdom works. And today he's calling us to humbly accept his gift of grace. And if you haven't done that, I would encourage you to today. That's all I've got. Eli, do you want to wrap us up? This term at Youth Church, we've been looking at big questions such as why church and why Jesus? On week two, we discussed why God there is a scientific law that says nothing comes from nothing and everything needs to come from something. Everything is caused by something. This means the nothingness would have been endless before the world was created. There must have been something or someone to cause everything to come into existence. God is the uncaused cause that created all the other caused causes. I've always known that God was there but this explanation has helped me understand it more and get a grasp on how that is. The same week, we watched a video by Louis Giglio. He talked about how God breathed out the universe but spoke us into existence. He, talked, he also talked about how small the earth is compared to the sun and all the giant stars. The fact that God spoke us into existence when he breathed out the whole universe 
really stood out to me from this. This helped me realise how special we are to him and how significant we are in his plan.